Praise God for a beautiful day to gather for worship. So a, a story is told of uh, two police officers who responded to a call from the dispatcher about a bad auto accident. And they got there to find a father, a mother, and two children in the car, and they were unconscious. So they got them, you know, the ambulance arrived, and they got them you know, out of the car and into the ambulance. And that's when they noticed there was also a monkey in the car, and the monkey was conscious. So they thought, let's interview the monkey and see if we can get some information here. So they asked the monkey, they said, what was the father doing at the time of the accident? And the monkey gestures. And they're like, oh, okay, the father's drinking. And, and what was the mother doing while, before the accident? And, and, the, and the monkey gestures. Said, oh, okay, the father's drinking and the mother's yelling at him about it. What were the children doing during, you know, just before the accident? And the monkey goes, yes. okay, so it's obvious what was going on. The father's drinking and the mother's hollering at him and the children are fighting each other. Now we know what happened. They start to walk away and then one of them says, wait a minute, what were you doing during the accident? And the monkey goes, <laughs> We'll come back to that in just a minute. Today I want to talk about spiritual leadership in the church and in the home. Last week's sermon, we explored what the Bible says about God's plan for the distinctive roles for men and women in the church. And we learned that men and women have equal status, have equal value before God, and yet they have different roles. They have distinctive roles. We learned that God's given the primary role of spiritual leadership to men in the church and in the home. Well, after that sermon last week, one of the men of the congregation came to me and said, I'd really like for you to follow up that sermon with one that addresses what that spiritual leadership for men should look like. And so, in response to that, I said, you know, that's, that's a great idea. I hadn't thought about doing that, but... But I will, and that's what this sermon is today. So I want to begin with the obvious question. What kind of men are supposed to be driving the church and the home? What kind of men are supposed to be leading the church and the home? Well, certainly the right answer isn't men acting like silly monkeys, right? Although if you know me very well, you know I sometimes like to pretend to be a monkey. Yes, it's true. When I'm around children, if there's a banana nearby and I eat some banana, I transform into a monkey for a couple of minutes. And maybe sometime I'll do it for you if you ask for it. But anyhow, the kind of men that God wants steering the church and steering the home are spiritual men of God. So in today's lesson, I want us to look at what the Bible says about men in their spiritual leadership in the church and in the home. What kind of things should the women that we're leading in the church and in the home, what kind of things should they expect from men who are leading the church and the home? See, this is a lesson that's important for all of us. It isn't just for the men who are doing the leading. It's a lesson for all of us because we're all responsible for maintaining God's will and for holding each other accountable to the commands of God. And so if you don't already know the answer to the question of what kind of men, uh, you know, what kind of spiritual leadership men should be giving, you know, the answer is ultimately the calling is high, right? God has called men and has a high expectation for the kind of role that men will play. And although none of us men who are trying to carry out God's leadership in the church and the home are perfect, and we will never be perfect, we still must keep clearly in view the high expectation and the calling and to be aiming to fulfill it. So with that as an introduction, let's turn our attention first to God's expectations for spiritual leadership in the church. And so who am I talking about when I address male spiritual leaders in the church? I'm talking about primarily elders and deacons and evangelists or ministers. Let's begin with God's general expectations for spiritual leadership. So Matthew 20, what we read for the scripture reading, thank you Josh for reading that, uh, 
we have in this uh, Jesus talking about spiritual leadership, right? Uh, uh, Jesus is approached in that context by the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And as a typical mother, she's looking to enhance the opportunities for her sons. So she comes to Jesus and says, Hey, when you come into your kingdom and glory, how about letting my sons be your right hand and left hand guys, right? Sit at your right and left on your throne in glory. The Bible says that when the other disciples heard what the mother of James and John had done, they were indignant which means they were upset they hadn't thought of it first, right? And hadn't approached Jesus first. That's what that means, right? So Jesus used it as an opportunity to teach his apostles about godly spiritual leadership. Look again at those verses. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. So they're under Roman rule. And those leaders, those emperors, they lord it over, right? Those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So what do we learn from Jesus' words? We learn that ungodly, unspiritual leadership is all about power and position and about using your position to serve yourself. The leader is self-serving. Godly spiritual leadership is the exact opposite. The leader serves rather than is the one who is being served. And Jesus, of course, is the perfect example. He, being God, comes as a leader, a spiritual leader, but He comes not to receive service, but to serve. A man named Robert Townsend, whose leadership transformed Avis into the rental car giant that it is today, said this, True leadership must be for the benefit of the followers, not the enrichment of the leaders. And he certainly had the idea right. I wonder where he got it from. Maybe from Jesus, right? So Jesus had many serious criticisms of the Jewish leaders of his time, but some of the harshest judgments against them were, were because their leadership was self-serving. Here in Matthew 23, you've, you've got this long uh, oration of Jesus where he is coming on the Jewish leaders and he's criticizing them, giving them a scathing rebuke. Let's read just seven of those verses. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. That means they're in the place of leadership over Israel. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and they put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and they lengthen their tassels and they love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces to be called rabbi by the people. And so those bad spiritual leaders didn't practice what they preached. And they didn't even lift a finger to help others with the things they were teaching. What were they about? Well, they were all about outward displays of religiosity, right? They, they, they were looking for all the perks that came with being spiritual leaders. Special clothes special names, special places of honor, and the only people benefiting from their leadership was themselves. Not good. So what should spiritual leadership look like for elders and deacons and evangelists? The Apostle Peter wrote some great instructions in his first letter in chapter 5. He wrote, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, 
not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the cheap shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. So the idea of shepherding sheep is a great illustration of the kind of leadership God wants for spiritual leaders in the church. And you know, sheep need good shepherds, right? Sheep need to be protected. They have no defense. Sheep need to be fed. They, they're, they're simple. They don't understand. They need to be taken to good grass and, and, and quiet waters and all those kind of things. They get injured. They need someone to heal them. All the things that sheep need really are things that people need as well, right? They need protection. and They need feeding. And they need healing and help and things like that. So Peter says spiritual leaders should lead willingly. Have a willing heart, not under compulsion. He says they must not lead for self-serving reasons, right? Not for monetary gain to make themselves rich. Not for power. And a spiritual leader's most powerful tool really isn't their words, although words are important, teaching's important, The real powerful tool of the leader is their example. Not just saying the thing, but doing it. Showing the way. Leading by example. Another great passage for spiritual leadership, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul writes this, and he sounds a lot like Peter. They're both good spiritual leaders, right? Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit with you is not without result. On the contrary, after we'd previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. For our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God's our witness. We didn't seek glory from people, neither you nor from others. Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you as a nurse nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you'd become so dear to us. For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached God's gospel to you and your witnesses. And so is God of how devoutly and righteously and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each of you to live a life worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Now, that's a long passage, and there's a lot there. But I want you, I hope you heard the heart of Paul as he talked about the kind of spiritual leadership that he brought to those Thessalonians. He describes his leadership like that of a mother or or a nursing mother nurturing her children, feeding them, caring for them, like a father comforting and urging and taking care of his spiritual children. And, And so when he describes it like that, he doesn't see his role as a spiritual leader as some kind of job. It's a connection, it's a community. It's a family. It's relational. Where he shares not only the truth of God, but his life. The lives are inter, you know, interconnected to each other in this spiritual model of leadership. Of course, he didn't use deception or flattery. That has no place. He didn't have greedy motives. As a matter of fact, he could have been supported by them in the work, but he was a tradesman. He could make tents, and so he worked night and day so that he wouldn't be a financial burden on them. That's excellent spiritual leadership. Let's look at another passage that describes spiritual leadership in the church. And this one's from the same letter, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, but in chapter 5. So it's toward the end of the letter. 
Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. So in this passage, you see the symbiotic relationship that ought to be going on amongst the leadership and the followership in the body of Christ. It's a mutual thing with spiritual leaders doing a good job, doing their best job leading, and the followers doing their best job to cooperate, to encourage the leadership and support it. But you see how each person needs to be handled individually, right? Some need to be helped. Others need to be warned or admonished, right? And so everyone needs to be sensitive to everyone else, the leadership and everyone else, so that you do what is good for everyone. Washington, uh, George Washington Carver, that great American scientist and inventor, once said, how far you go in life depends on being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, tolerant of the weak and the strong, because someday in life you will have been all of these. It's like Jesus' golden rule, right? Treat others as you want to be treated. This is good for leadership. It's good for followership. It's good for all of us. If you're the leader, how do you want to be treated? If you're the follower, how do you want to be treated? Treat others as you would want to be treated. Take note of all their spiritual needs and individual needs. Good spiritual leaders keep this as a guiding principle. Now, a lot more could be said about spiritual leadership in the church. We'll stop with that. Let's turn our attention now to, to spiritual leadership in the home. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about the role of, of husbands and the role of fathers and their spiritual leadership. And the Bible certainly has a lot to say about the high calling and the high expectations that God has for husbands and for fathers. And just like I mentioned with spiritual leaders in the church, there are no husbands and there are no fathers that are perfect, or who will ever be perfect, and yet God's perfect expectations are something we should always be striving toward, to become better and better as we go. Let's take a quick survey of God's commands and expectations for husbands and fathers. Let's start first with husbands. And most of us are familiar with Paul's challenging instructions for husbands in his letter to the Ephesians, right? Let's read those verses. Husbands... Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her to make her holy, <clears throat> cleansing her with the washing of water by the Word. He did this to present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy, blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we're members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, this high calling, these high expectations that God has for husbands really center in on the word love, right? Husbands, are to love their wives just like Christ loves the church. And how does Christ love the church? How did Christ love the church? Obviously, He loved it sacrificially to the point of giving His very life for His bride. But a husband's love for his wife should cause him to put her interests and her needs even ahead of His own, just as Christ put the needs of the body of Christ ahead of His own. A husband's goal should be to help his wife flourish and blossom. And I love that picture of Christ you know, purifying the body of Christ, His bride, to make her splendorous you know, and, and holy. And, 
And a husband should be wanting to do that for his wife. And because the husband and wife are one, when the husband does what's best for his wife, he's ultimately doing what's best for him because we're that connected. We're one flesh, one entity. And when a husband loves his wife like Christ loved the church, the command for wives to respect and submit to their husbands becomes a very easy command, right? If a husband's loving his wife like that, why wouldn't she want to be respecting him and, and, and encouraging his leadership? But the husband is to be the leader. He's to be the initiator, setting the climate of love so his wife can easily, in that symbiotic relationship, respect him and follow his lead. In Paul's parallel passage written to the Colossians, <clears throat> Paul's much more brief. You, you, know, you look at what he wrote in Ephesians about husbands and what he wrote here in Colossians to the husbands, you think, wow, they got kind of robbed, didn't they? Uh, the Colossian church got the real Reader's Digest version. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. The NIV says don't be harsh with them. As I've read the NIV for years. But to be bitter would mean resentful, disgruntled, spiteful. Harsh carries with it the idea of cruel, severe, dictatorial, intolerant. But again, remember the model of overall spiritual leadership. Whether it's in the church or in the home, the husband is to be the servant leader of the wife, not the dictatorial leader. The Apostle Peter also offers important instructions for husbands when he wrote in in chapter 3 and verse 7, Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, there's a lot in that verse. Let's take a little bit of it apart and, 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 and learn from it. Notice the phrase, he begins with, in the same way. He's using this in reference to the fact that he'd already said something about wives earlier in the chapter, saying in the same way wives should do this toward their husbands. In the same way of what? Well, the chapter before he's talking about slaves and masters and citizens, that they're in the same way to be submissive to God and submissive to those in authority in the same way wives should, in the same way husbands. So husbands are to carry out their role in submission to God, just as wives and slaves and citizens are to be in submission to God and to those in authority over them. So the one word that summarizes what Peter says to husbands about their relationship with their wives is the word consideration. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible that I have here on the screen, uses the word understanding in an understanding way. Live with your wives in that way, right? So Paul says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We must be sensitive and consider. Live in an understanding way. Love means to consider our wives' deepest physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. The husband must know and understand his wife, her feelings, her moods, her hopes, her dreams, her fears. We need to learn to listen. Listen with our eyes and ears, but listen with our hearts. To live in an understanding way, a considerate way with our wives. That's what love means. And he said this consideration includes a respect for our wives when we recognize two special things about them. Number one, we recognize that they are the weaker partner. Before you get all upset at Peter, let's understand what he means by that, right? He doesn't mean weaker morally. He doesn't mean weaker spiritually. And he certainly doesn't mean weaker intellectually. So in what ways is the wife the weaker partner? Well, certainly physically, right? Characteristically, God has made our bodies differently. And men, most of the time, have a stronger body than most women do. So certainly that. 
But there's also a weakerness, if you want to call it that, in a sensitivity emotionally. God's wired us differently. And women have a, a better sense of emotion than, than many men do. And so what I like, if I were doing a paraphrase of this, I would say that uh, we, it ought to read something like, uh, you know, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a fine piece of china. Right? Handle them as a fine piece of china. Look at your wife as a valuable, delicate vase. Maybe I wish they would, you know, women would come stamped with somewhere we could see it clearly. Fragile. Handle with care. Handle with care. And many men never come to understand how their harshness, how their inconsideration or unconsideration, non understanding, harms their wife and their marriage. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Understanding they are the weaker vessel. The weaker partner. But also recognizing they are co-heirs with salvation. Our wives are our spiritual partners. Our spiritual equals. And God's rewards and His blessings eternally will be shared as co-heirs. Yes, men have a spiritual role of leadership, but that doesn't make them any better or superior to their wives, not in this world and not in the next, when we'll be co-heirs. Our wives must never be treated as inferior, but with, treated with consideration, honor, respect. Now, there are many important reasons why uh, us husbands ought to treat our wives this way. But Peter mentions only one important reason. He says, treat your wives this way so that your prayers will not be hindered. How a man treats his wife is a spiritual matter between himself and his God. And when a husband mistreats his wife, his fellowship with the Lord is broken and his prayers are powerless. Can you think of any more serious divine threats than to not hear your prayers? There aren't too many I can think of. Certainly, you know, if, unless you treat your wife with respect in this way, uh, you're going to hell. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty serious. But just that side of that one, treat your wives in the right way or God won't hear your prayers, that's pretty serious stuff. The threat by God to shut off His divine blessings shows us just how critical it is for the Christian husband to be lovingly considerate and respectful of his wife. Let me give one final word about how... He, God's high calling to husbands, and then we'll just quickly touch on, on the role as fathers. God calls us to fidelity to our wives. And this isn't just a command for husbands. It's also a command for wives. Both of us are to have a faithfulness to each other. The Hebrew writer writes it this way in one single verse. Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers. God will judge them, male or female, right? Husband or wife. If either of them is not behaving with regard to fidelity in the way God wants, God's going to take care of that. That's an issue. But this fidelity should include sexual purity of the heart, of the mind, and certainly of the body. Satan's traps... He's trying to get husbands and wives both to fall into and get stuck in. Include all kinds of sexual immorality and adultery. Including emotional, relational attachments. Right? It doesn't have to be a full-blown sexual, physical thing. If you become tied emotionally to someone other than your spouse in a way that you should only be tied emotionally to your spouse, even if it's virtual, right? 
even if it's just online, it's wrong. Of course, pornographic appetites, the feeding of them through the television shows we watch or the movies we watch or the internet sites and activity we engage in, all of that defiles the relationship and the marriage and should be avoided. With God's help, let's honor our marriages, keeping them strong and pure and undefiled. This is God's will. Let's turn to our attention to fathers just quickly. I wish we had more time, but we're doing a quick survey of this. God's provided some powerful, uh, wonderful passages for fathers and, and for, for mothers in Deuteronomy. Like this one. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The Word of God should be present in the home. And the spiritual father should be helping his children come to know the Word of God, certainly in formal ways, Bible reading, devotionals, but sometimes more impactfully through the informal ways, the while you're walking along the road, those teachable moments when something happens and, and you praise God and point to Scripture, say, this is what God meant when He said... Right? Those are teachable moments. This is something Paul included when he gave his instructions to fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, the uh, Christian standard Bible reads, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The NIV, the old NIV, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In that parallel passage in the letter of Colossians, Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. The NIV chooses the word embitter for that Colossians passage. Fathers, do not embitter your children so they won't be discouraged. How might a father stir up anger in his children? How might a father embitter his children or exasperate his children? Well, there are many ways it can happen, surely. He might do it by being too harsh, right? Too demanding. He might do it by never being satisfied, always raising the bar. So, the, you know, he's harsh and demanding, and the second the child achieves what he asked for, what does he do? He just changes it a little higher, right? And they get that feeling they'll never satisfy their dad, right? He might do it by being inconsistent or over-disciplining, you know, making a huge issue out of a smaller thing and not having the right kind of, of discipline or punishment associated with the crime, so to speak. When a father stirs up anger and bittering and, and exasperating a child, the child sometimes will rebel, right? And sometimes they just give up. There are a lot of great proverbs on parenting and fathering. Uh, I wish we had time to go through all of these, but you know, Proverbs 22.6, the old King James, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old. He'll not depart from it. You know, plant those seeds early and get them on the right path. And even if they take the wrong path, there, there's the hope that the, that the seeds are there and they'll come back. Proverbs 22.15, foolishness is bound to the heart of youth. Children have a foolishness involved in childishness. And it has to be disciplined and taught and trained out of them. Proverbs 13, 24, the one who will not use the rod hates his son, but the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son while there is hope. Don't set your heart on being the cause of his death. Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your child, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. And the discipline that the proverb writer in the Bible is talking about has more to do with training and teaching than punishing. Um, but it's needed. Children need the teaching, training, and discipline of fathers and mothers. So the ultimate goal for fathers should be to provide for his children, to protect his children, and to love his children with the love of God, teaching them to love God, teaching them to walk in God's ways. 
A whole lot more could be said about fathering, but this sermon's a sermon about spiritual leadership in both the church and the home, so we better leave it at that. I want to end with something that Ruth Graham, the wife of uh, the famous evangelist Billy Graham, wrote. This is something she wrote before she ever met Billy, before she, uh, while she was a missionary, a single adult missionary in China, thinking that she would likely never marry and just continue to be a, a single female missionary. She wrote this, and I think it's a good description of what all of us men should be striving toward. She wrote, if I marry, he must be so tall that when he's on his knees, as one has said, he reaches all the way to heaven. A man of prayer. His shoulders must be broad enough to bear the burden of his family. His lips must be strong enough to smile. Firm enough to say no. Tender enough to kiss. Love must be so deep that it takes its stand in Christ and so wide that it takes the whole lost world in. He must be active enough to be gentle. Great enough to be thoughtful. His arms must be strong enough to carry a little child. Oh, the calling for us men is a high one. As spiritual leaders in the church and in the home, as husbands and fathers, it's not an easy one. There's no way we can do it without God's help, or at least do it as well as we can. So let's do our best with God's help, right? We owe it to God. We owe it to the church. We owe it to our spouses and our children to keep on growing as men of God and growing in our ability to be and to provide the right kind of spiritual leadership. And God will bless it.